so we can see that we have two very distinguished speakers today who can contribute both on the diplomatic security as well as on the uh, the economic uh, and geo uh, geo economic risk related aspects of this particular conflict so with that i will not take too much of time uh, talking about uh, this particular conflict i will certainly raise a few questions uh, through which i would like to probe and get further insights from our uh, our resource persons so first of all i would like to uh, invite ambassador ambassador patrick to make his uh, arguments on the ukraine crisis and how it has impacted uh, europe and the rest of the world over to you ambassador patrick you can speak for around uh, 15 20 minutes and then uh, you can uh, uh, answer the questions which the students and the other audiences as well as i also will have some questions for you thank you uh, dr nan for your kind introduction uh, i'm very uh, pleased and honored to take part in this uh, discussion organized by asian pathfinders and your university uh, manipal academy of higher education we we are uh, taking today a very uh, large issue is, uh, is it will be difficult for me and also for all participants to summarize our, our thoughts in in a very short time but i will do my best it's it's, it's indeed a very critical uh, critical issue uh, because the war in ukraine doesn't uh, just concern um, citizen of europe and uh, the fact that you're organizing this discussion uh, is uh, is a proof of that Uh, the conflict is not a world war but it is a globalized war um, uh, in the sense that all regions of the world are uh, their economies their alliance uh, prospect of for their development and uh, the whole international system are probably affected so it's uh, it's um, it's essential that we 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 reflect on on all these aspects of uh, all the impacts of the ukraine crisis This topic is particularly stimulating. Um, uh, we, are, we can raise uh, several questions to what extent the, those, uh, the war in Ukraine affects so many uh, regions of the world, uh, change their autonomy, their legitimate ambitions. Um, have we not returned to the time of block confrontation? That's also a, a question. Um, as it was the case during the Cold War, for example, it's, it's a different uh, Cold War. It's not the same. I will explain, I will elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, and is there is still an international system working? Um, uh, where is the place of uh, the role of playing by the UN, United Nations, for example, now? Uh, I remember at the end of the Soviet Union, I was, I was posted in New York at the French mission to the United Nations. And uh, we had the feeling that the uh, UN, as in particular the Security Council, was crippled. Was not functioning, and there was a kind of crisis of confidence there. But um, today, is it maybe even worse. It may be even worse. Not only the uh, Security Council is, is is crippled, cannot take any decision because of the confrontation of of uh, of members. But one 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 members uh, one permanent members uh, took uh, get rid of of some basic principle of international law. That's, that's a real problem. So I will try to answer all these questions. There are probably many, many others. Uh, and I will um, gather my thoughts around three, three same uh, immediate uh, and maybe material effects of the Ukraine uh, tragedy. Secondly, um, what about the international system? As I was just mentioned, uh, it, it's obviously undermined by the situation. And third, uh, Can we try to think about a new order and which part, uh, which role, will imp which importance uh, some, some part of the world could play? And I'm thinking in particular of India, for, 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 for sure. So the, the consequence, immediate and material effects of, of the war, uh, everybody knows that the war of, it's not, it's not a special operation like, like a Chechnya war was, was a cold uh, in its time. It's, it's a war of high intensity. Um, it's a tragedy for, for the population directly concerned uh, in terms of human rise, lives. Uh, for Ukrainian fighters, also for, for Russian fighters, so we are, I'm thinking also of them. Uh, they are 
Um, there are many civilian victims altogether. According to the estimates, uh, we are talking about two, 200,000 Russian and 100,000 Ukrainians. It's, it's, it's a huge number uh, view, in particular from Europe on the European continent. It's no, there is no precedent since the Second World War on, on our continent. We have thousand uh, million of refugees in Europe. Only in France, we shelter, we welcome and shelter, it's not uh, 100,000 uh, at the cost of, uh, for one year, of uh, 500 million euro. Uh, well, uh, and, and there are countries like Poland or Germany where you have even more refugees because they are even closer to, to the conflict. And all these phenomena are affecting uh, the balance of uh, our society. There, is, there will be a cost for rebuilding, rebuilding the, the country, Ukraine. According to Ukrainian estimates, it's now around 700, 800 billion dollars to rebuild Ukraine at this stage. And let's imagine that the war would continue. What would be the cost eventually? Well, entire city are destroyed. You all see the pictures, videos, uh, it's remember uh, Berlin or Dresden at the end of the Second World War sometimes. But also the war, and I will, I will maybe uh, insist on, on that, it, it may be of interest to, to you, it's affecting, of course, our economic exchange. Uh, uh, just one, one example, uh, China. China was importing, uh, I, I don't know what's the situation now, 80% of cereal uh, or grain imported by China came from Ukraine. Can you imagine how, how is it sustainable for, for the, this country? Energy supply circuits have been uh, disrupted. Uh, not only the closure of Nord Stream 1 and, and Nord Stream 2, uh, that has particularly affected Europe. Uh, now now uh, Europe is no more importing oil and gas from, from Russia. It's a, it's a major change. Um, and um, the longer, in fact, the longer uh, a, a war is always very costly, but the longer the conflict in Ukraine will last, the less likely it will be uh, uh, that the pre-war supply channels of energy will be reestablished. Because uh, Europe is now organizing uh, differently, and maybe Russia also is uh, more thinking of exporting its gas or its oil to, to the east. Well, um, um, well, if if I maybe I will answer some questions about that. But if we we summarize for Russia, it's my personal view that for Russia, cutting itself off from Europe would would have serious consequences. Uh, people don't necessarily know, uh, in particular in Europe, uh, strangely that. Uh, 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 part of investment coming from Europe has increased during the last uh, years. When I was in Russia, it was around uh, 50, uh, 60 percent. Now it's even more. 75 percent of, in of investment in Russia are coming from Europe. So, uh, so Russia is, was uh, connected, really connected to, to Europe. Uh, do, uh, is it the end of that or not? It's a, it's a really big question. I, I don't think that Russia could uh, cut off its, itself from, from Europe. It's not its interest, but it's not up to me to decide. And also there is a logic of the war. We don't know how will be the outcome of this war. Well, so now a different uh, aspect of my, my presentation, the second one is uh, all the disruption caused to the international system. I mentioned that that um, the Cold War order, the Cold War order, was paradoxically uh, 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 based on on a balance, a balance of terror, a balance of terror. We, we use that expression, uh, and and this this period ended with with uh, um, in ninety one. I would. Uh, it's always difficult to fix a moment when when a period is ending because history is not like that. But we can say that in, uh, in 1991, that at the same time, the year of the disappearance of the Soviet Union, also of the Gulf War. Gulf War is a very important moment uh, of this year. Uh, the Cold War was followed by what George Bush Senior, uh, President of the United States, called a new international order. Was it really a new order, an order 
or was it an order dominated by the United States? I think it was dominated by the United States, but it didn't exclude some multilateral cooperation because the UN was working at the same time. There was no more confrontation because the big power, like, like at the time of the Soviet Union, and with Gorbachev, we, we had the experience of uh, kind of cooperation among, among uh, the permanent member of the Security Council. And it helped to solve many crises in the world. We have the independence of Namibia. We had the end of apartheid. We had, we had the settlement of Iran, Iraq war, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the end of apartheid, well. So it was, it was a golden moment, I, I would say. And now, now we are we are in a different period again. So it's the third third period of the system uh, uh, where new poles of power are emerging. I think that India is a big pole of the coming multipolarity. It's my it's my and it's it's. Uh, um, I think we we it, it it will it will be a very positive uh, move. So the situation today. Um, uh, um, so we, we as I said. Uh, uh, Security Council is not working anymore. Um, uh, we had a violation of uh, UN Charter by a permanent member of Security Council. Yeah, and also was very worrying that uh, I was referring to the balance of terror. But during this war in Ukraine, many times, uh, the reference uh, mention of non-conventional, I will, I will use this expression, non-conventional uh, weapons, has been used. That means nuclear wars is very worrying that the country could mention that he, he could, it may, might use, uh, uh, even if it's not, it's not a really serious threat. So the, the, just the fact that it's been mentioned uh, uh, um, show how, 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 how touchy is now the situation. We, we never know what could, ha what could happen when you, you have a war go going on. You never know. Well, um, now, um, uh, third, third uh, development is, uh, we, let's try to think about a new order. Um, um, uh, I think this new order will be largely determined by uh, the condition for ending the current war in, in uh, Ukraine. It will shape, will shape uh, the end of the, the outcome of the war, will shape the, the new order. Um, the question is, at this stage, uh, will finally prevail uh, uh, force or law? That's a, that's a, a critical issue. Uh, uh, is it clear that if uh, uh, um, uh, uh, force would prevail, uh, the new order would, the, f the foundation of the new order would not be very solid? Uh, before the before the end before the war in Ukraine, we already had a very volatile situation, uh, and uh, there was a trend to I was referring to new power, new pole of multipolarity emerging. But at the same time, uh, we had also a tendency to the constitution of block blocks. That is very, very worrying. Let's let's take a few examples. President of the French Republic, Mr. Macron, uh, before the war, uh, uh, considered that NATO wa was brain dead. That's the expression he used himself, brain dead. It surprised many people. But we, uh, 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 but now, due to the war, NATO has been revitalized and even enlarged with the prospect of, be of being enlarged to Sweden and Finland in Europe. And what about Ukraine in the future? We don't know. That's, that's, a, it's a, it's a, that's an argument for Russia to say, we, we, we had a threat from NATO. We had the prospect of Ukraine being a member of, of, of NATO. In fact, this, this question had been frozen in 2008 during the NATO summit in Bucharest. We, President of France and Chancellor Merkel opposed the prospect of NATO, Ukraine being a member of NATO, but nevertheless, so what will be NATO in, in the future? And that's what we are young for us, European, because we are, we are a member, France, for example, a member of NATO, but we always had a certain uh, specificity within the alliance. And Mr. Mark, Macron, who is referred to brain dead uh, uh, NATO, was also advocating for what he called uh, 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 more uh, European auto uh, autonomy, strategy, uh, strategy of more European autonomy within the NATO. 
Let's take now a second example, and I will, I will not uh, say more about that. Let's concerning a tendency to, to blocks. Let's, say, let's take Indo-Pacific, where India and France have very close cooperation. We are not India and France member of the AUKUS, which was formed in, in September 2021. But AUKUS with Australia, United Kingdom, and, and uh, United States is a kind of probably an element of anti-Beijing system. It's, it's a block also. I'm not sure we will solve the problem of the region all, all, only with the confrontation of blocks. We, it's, not, it's not our approach in general of international relations. Um, so, uh, uh, and now last word about uh, uh, India. I think India had, uh, you, are, you, will, you are expert, and I'm not an expert of India, but I, I feel that I, I always observe the quality of uh, Indian diplomacy within, within international forums. And, and I know uh, uh, we, we are, since, since many years, we have been advocating for India getting a permanent member of the Security Council. I'm sure it will happen. I'm sure that UN will, will change after the war. We, we need, in fact, we need, in fact, a different voice within the UN. It's it's our it's not only to make you to 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 tell you nice words, but it's our, our interest because the more different views you have in the in the Security Council, the more elbow room it will give to us. Uh, we but because we are not a big power, we we are a medium power within the Council. So there is a lot we can do. We uh, I'm sure that the system will change. I, I think that it will be rebuilt. It will reflect more uh, um, uh, the situation, uh, balance of power in the world, uh, this emerging new poles of power. And so that's maybe uh, a positive. It's difficult to say a one, one war, a war could have positive, co positive consequences, but let's try to be positive and let's try to work in that direction. So I thank you for your attention. And uh, of course, I'm ready to answer all, all the questions you may have on this uh, very major topic. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks for your insights uh, into the conflict and uh, what it portends for the Europe and the rest of the world. And I appreciate your views uh, that you have about uh, India's attitude and approach towards this uh, conflict and its diplomacy in, in general. Uh, I do have some questions for you, but I think uh, let's listen now to what uh, Ms. Radha has to say about this conflict, especially from a geoeconomic perspective, since she has been specializing on uh, the supply chain uh, risks, especially. And looking at, uh, from looking at the conflict from that particular perspective, how do you see this conflict is impacting the global economy? and the economy of the different regions, important regions of the world, and especially looking at it from the global supply chain's perspective. I would like to uh, uh, ask Sradha to reflect on her understanding on this particular issue for our benefit. Uh, over to you, Ms. Sradha. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Uh, I'm in such esteemed company, uh, Ambassador. I mean, with your background and experience, I don't know what I'll be able to add to what you've already said, but it's quite a privilege. And so nice to see a specialized course in geopolitics. When I was studying, um, I had to figure out how to sort of appease my interest in the area on my own. Um, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but just this will be. So, um, you know, um, I sort of reflected on the topic. It's a very interesting, to interesting topic, and I've tried to frame some points. The problem with the world today is not only perceptions are being contested, but even facts are being contested, right? So I, I stay in Dubai and I live in the Middle East, in the North Africa region, and I'm very closely connected to India. A lot of things that are emerging in the Western media, this area does not agree with. So, um, of course, there's a general agreement that what Russia did in Ukraine is absolutely breaking of the international order. But what led to it and what is coming out of it is something that the... Uh, I think it's it's sort of a West versus rest emerging in a lot of ways, which will fundamentally shape how the international order going forth will look like. So just my few submissions, I'll speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, I think people can have a lot of questions later. So I would like to address those. 
Um, but what a year as a geopolitical analyst we've had in 2022. You know, every um, risk assessment module that we've had, every scenario gaming, every contingency planning has been challenged. Right. So um, the fragile peace that we used to live, we take, take for granted has been sort of put aside by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, along with COVID, it's revealed the fragility of the globalization. It's brought into question the vulnerability of supply chains, the Chinese growth model, and most importantly, the chinks in the unipolar world order. You know, they've always been, for the last 10 years, we've been hearing that the US unipolar world has been challenged, but I think the Ukraine conflict brought that to the fore in a very dramatic way. You know, uh, very quickly, the focus shifted from cooperation on COVID rejuvenation to conflict, um, to confrontation and to weaponization. I'll quickly explain for the student's benefit what weaponization means. When you use a resource that you have control over to basically get your geopolitical aims. And oh my, last year, everything was weaponized from energy uh, to the international sort of financial system um, to shipping, transport, ancillary services, um, energy price cap, you know, there was nothing that uh, in, in terms of the, of, the, of the sanctions on Russia and then sort of related sanctions on China on export controls of technology, there was a lot of weaponization sort of that happened. Um, there was massive disruptions of supplies of energy, of food, of commodities like fertilizers, and they just brought into fore how important traditional sort of security concepts are. Um, it seemed like regionalism is, is being touted by uh, what the global order is throwing, the challenges that the global order is throwing. And, and that's how 2022 emerged in one aspect. But it was also the year when the mid powers, India, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, um, UAE, um, Nigeria, I mean, all of these countries, Brazil, that have traditionally punched below their, their sort of political economic weight came to the fore. I think G20 was the most stark example of, of how these sort of countries came together to fundamentally try and reshape the Western financial trading and, um, and, the, and the economic arena. You know, there, um, there were islands of regional opportunities. So in, in, I, I live in an area where in the GCC, where a number of opportunities have emerged and a number of sectors frog leap, right? So the transition to energy, of course, is one sector that has gotten a lot of attention amidst the larger bleaker environment. You've got technologies of the future. There are a lot of things happening on, on for example, metaverse, blockchain, AI. Um, you, you've got uh, new sort of supply chains emerging where the I2U2, for example, which is India, Israel, UAE, and uh, United States uh, sort of coordinating on six core areas. So it's been a year where, yes, there have been... Um, superpower rivalries, protectionism, nationalization, weaponization, but it's also been an area where I think the global order itself is pushing people to form these regional alliances. So th these trends were there pre the Ukraine conflict as well, but I think the Ukraine conflict just uh, through stark limelight, um, it gave the mid powers a, a unity which they had not seen earlier. And it just created that West versus the rest. I think that's also a little overhyped, but that's that's the scenario that 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 sort of came about in the way. Um, so going forward, you know, what I see is what I call um, a balance that the so I always look at things from a business viewpoint because that's where the consulting comes in. We're living in an era where we'll have to balance the the superpower rivalries and its implications with uh, the imperatives of globalization, right? So. Regional supply chains, for example, are a very important part of, of this of this globalized, the component fractured uh, trade that we live in. Um, so I call what we're living in at the moment a world between orders, right? So um, there is a unipolar world order, which is the United States, which is, I don't know whether really or in perception losing its power, but it's not given way to anything yet, right? So there is US and its allies on one side, there is China, Russia, and its opportunistic partners on the other side. And in the middle, there are a number of mid powers that are forming um, alliances in very opportunistic ways to fulfill their uh, ambitions, their economic aspirations, their regional aspirations, right? So, you know, there's a difference between this kind of regionalism and the kind of regionalism we've seen since the end of the Second World War. Um, the kind of regionalism that uh, we saw in Asia, for example, that the US provided the, the guarantee of the, of the security architecture. In the Middle East, it was the, the, the petrodollar was the basis of, of the alliances that emerged. 
um, in in uh, Asia again, China, China, and the supply chains that led to a very strong regionalism. You know, there was a certainty in this world order, which the companies find they found much easier to navigate. Right, so you knew that you could go into a geography, uh, even if it's considered hostile, and there will be no sanctions on you, and you would still be allowed to operate. That has fundamentally changed. Now it's been changing for some years, but I think the Ukraine conflict has just brought that to, brought to a lot of force. So I'll give you some example of opportunistic regionalism, and then I'll go to impact on companies. Uh, the GCC, right? That's an area which um, I think not enough attention is paid in, in the dominant media. Um, there, so out of the 20 sovereign wealth funds in the world, uh, out of 10, actually, the top four or five are now in the GCC, right? So UAE, Saudi, Qatar, um, about 3 trillion in assets. They are investing left, right, and center in the region, in North Africa, of course, in the world as well. But I'm just focusing here because they're creating regional interdependencies. So most of the uh, so Egypt has very be, been very badly hit by the Ukrainian crisis because it's a largely import uh, import economy. Uh, they've had a cost of living crisis. Their currency is depreciated. A lot of their assets have become pretty useless. It's Saudi, it's UAE, it's Qatar, which is bailing out these assets uh, in in a very big way. So the sovereign wealth funds are doing it. Uh, the GCC itself has been moving towards rapprochement for a number of years. Uh, I think the Ukraine conflict has just speeded up. Um, I'll just point out three factors here, which I think are responsible for this kind of rapprochement post the Ukraine conflict. The first one is a disquiet that's been caused by uh, the Western sanctions on Russia, which included the price gap, right? Which essentially means in a market that's been driven by sellers, the buyers are trying to decide the market, uh, the, the price. And this is something that's caused a lot of disquiet in OPEC. One of the major reasons that they cut production in December, despite the American pleas to sort of not cut oil production because sanctions on Russia were coming to effect. The second one that I feel has had a lot of disquiet is the freezing of the Russian assets, the 300 billion assets that have been frozen in the US banks, giving a sense that if you're not with us, um, we can take some your money, which, which is in our banks, right? Very, sorry, very simplistically and dumbing it down. And the third one has been, you know, this, this, um, this sort of bullying of every nation to take a stand in Ukraine, uh, which some of the closest allies have, have sort of defied. You know, Israel is, is, is a very prime example. They've done very, I mean, I was very surprised. They've done very limited things in Ukraine. I think one of the major reasons is that um, they have their own issues with Russia and Syria, et cetera. So they don't want to provoke a, a larger sort of uh, issues there. So th those are the things... Um, that is that have led to opportunistic regionalism. Africa is a very interesting space again. And I think a lot of work is coming out of, out of this um, in, in, in academia now that um, it's become, it's really what I call, pardon my language, one of the last Virgin Islands. You know, there are a lot of opportunities um, untapped. There is a population that, that is up, upwardly mobile that speaks both French and English. Um, the, the, the areas have come up, especially North Africa has come up in a big way. But it's become a ground of superpower rivalries in both positive and negative ways, right? So in, in negative ways, um, I think suddenly uh, attention has come on Africa, where the Wagner Group, which is the Russian paramilitary force, um, how they've made inroads in areas where, for example, the French have been withdrawing. So Mali, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic. It's been happening for some time, but I think the international limelight, especially the, the uh, limelight by the US has come post the Ukraine war. So you have an area where uh, a number of foreign forces are now operating. Um, so you've got the Wagner Group and, and Ghana, which borders Mali and Burkina Faso, has a, has a U.S. military base. It's the same with Nigeria, Somalia, Ethiopia. So in a way, it's increasing the risks of interstate conflict in Africa. Um, but on the other hand, there is also an economic angle to it. You know, the countries are now vying for investments in, in the African continent. China, of course, has a head start. Uh, the U.S., especially after Ukraine and seeing the Russian influence and Chinese influence in Africa, is now trying to sort of make up for years of neglect. France is already there. There's Belgium, but also the regional economies. You know, there is a competition between Saudi, Turkey and, um, and Egypt to sort of spread influence. So um, there's a term being used for Africa that the countries there are de-aligning, um, forming regional blocks and trying to play one superpower against another. So that's also been one of the impacts, a positive impact on regionalism of the Ukraine war. Um, so these are two examples. I go to Asia because that's where I think the regionalism has been massively disrupted. Um, when I advise companies, when come, so we just very recently in Confluence Consultants did our uh, um, annual horizon scanning for 2023. 
and the the main trends for the trading and the financial system were that it's it's a world where where companies have to balance between nationalization and weaponization and something called minilateralism and this is most prevalent in in asia because um, for the longest time you know there was an idiom uh, i don't know german but so pardon if i pronounce it wrongly it is called wanderdel something which means uh, conflict uh, sorry economy uh, and trade will trump conflict right asia has really believed in that for a number of years asian powers have tried to stay away from alliances they they've tried to sort of their own issues they put economics everywhere uh, they've tried to negotiate with china in asia that that centrality of regional supply chains is now being called into question right so you guys have must have heard about the concepts of near shoring reshoring um, you have defined china in a very adversarial way so uh, it has massive implications you know there was a there was a joke um, in a couple of years back that it is apple that maintained peace in the indo pacific you know because from china to vietnam to taiwan to all of these countries they had massive operations they made sure that trade flew in and out of of indo pacific that the south china sea and the east china sea will not be blocked by any military exercises you know all of that is now changing so for the companies i would say that you know economic imperatives of globalization continue and i will give you some examples but the geopolitical and political certainties that marked that order are now gone right so um the chinese the, the export controls on chinese tech in in uh, october 2023 or uh, 2022 which the us sort of it's one of the most um far reaching restrictions that the, that the us has put on china and it it just sort of there's no distinction between civil and military it does not only stop the the semiconductor and chip parts from reaching to china but even anyone related to the us uh, of of us born origin or related cannot help the chinese in its development right and and these are the bases of your ai or military applications so it is a blow um having said that you know about 95% of the trade in the world happens in very normal ways um I'll, it's it's a very I'll, it's a very component fracture trading system that we have i'll give you one example so shirts for example you know um india produces great quality cotton but it is um not very good with uh, for example fabric so the cotton flies to china for fabric china is not very good with dyeing it goes to a third country for dyeing um but it could be it's not good for stitching so it comes to vietnam it comes to uh, bangladesh for stitching and from there the brands pick up right and trade in in uh, 2022 was about i think if i'm not mistaken about um uh, about 32 trillion dollars which is almost one third of the global gdp of 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 about 100 trillion um so that trade will continue um it it is in a very as i said in a very component uh, splintered way which means different components are made in different parts um there so the the, the 5% of the of the top notch you know high tech um uh military applications related will be a sector that will be disrupted but you know what what really has happened with uh, with even the restrictions on zingjiang cotton right the companies realized that the resources can be quickly taken off the table it took about 8 months for russian energy to be um, outside of the main energy market you know wherever they're selling now they're either doing it in the black market or they're doing it within the price cap uh, or they're doing it with vessels which used to earlier uh, transport iranian and venezuelan oil for example um territories that you thought were great for your business could quickly become hostile russia is one example but myanmar you know you had a coup in myanmar uh, which meant uh, that the us sanctioned it japanese korean companies ended up losing so much money uh, then you've got sanctions of course uh, countries like belarus venezuela iran really don't matter because companies have learned to live with it but there is a clear and present danger that any country can be sanctioned um within within this us china russia superpower rivalry uh, they could be sanctioned and the third one is that a political backlash lawfare and sanctions are a clear and present danger you know uh, lawfare is another very interesting aspect um, so you've heard the sanctions that are coming on china russia china is also retaliating in its own way you know so there's an anti foreign sanctions act in china which says that any com- company that um, sort of follows the us sanctions or the sanctions can be challenged in the court of law in china ostensibly losing the big chinese market right you you've also uh, this is very interesting you know last year i think last year last last year all the rare earth minerals which basically power your uh, transition to clean energy 
um, all of them, all the companies were put under one major jurisdiction in China, which directly now reports to President Xi Jinping. So they, they are also thinking of weaponizing in the future. So these are the things that companies will have to look at um, when they plan. So this is what we tell everyone. Before you enter a geography, your market entry strategy, your diversification plans, your stakeholder analysis, your cultural analysis of what country you're going into. I'll give you a very simple example. In, in uh, two years back, Adidas, um, if I'm exceeding time, Dr. Anand, please let me know uh, because you know once I start talking on these things, I just don't stop. Um, so Adidas, Nike, Burberry, um, they ended up showing um, a map of South China Sea, which was not acceptable to China. Massive boycott by netizens. Overnight, their, uh, their sort of digital footprint vanished from the Chinese website. So you could have a shop right there, but it will not show on, your, on your, uh, the maps that, that, that are basically Chinese powered. So um, it, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic, but uh, it, is, it is an era of superpower rivalries where regional economies, countries like India, as, as his ambassador said, uh, GCC, Africa, are trying to temper down uh, the, the risks, create their own ways of doing things. But I would say globalization 2.0, as it's called, with its basic tenets of increasing trade between emerging economies, trying to sort of build new supply chains, component manufacture, components sort of printed, manufacturing is going to be very VUCA. Um, that's a risk term we use. It's vulnerability, uncertainty, something, and uh, ambiguity. You know, something, it's called a very VUCA world. Uh, that's something that the companies um, sort of will have to negotiate. Just one last point and I'll stop. Um, there are a lot of talk about uh, supply chains moving out of China. Um, you know, there is a China free supply chain, I think it's years in the making precisely because of the component manufacturing mastery that China has done in, in the last 30 to 40 years. Um, so I'll just give an example. You know, there's a lot of fanfare about iPhone coming to India and it's, it's a great thing that we've been able to attract uh, the iPhone in India, but iPhone realized that they still have to import components from China, which means that now there is a, there is a drive towards um, Chinese, some of the component manufacturer companies in China will be will be allowed in India under JVs with Indian companies. So it's a very, the, the trading systems that we've built in the last 30, 40 years are extremely interrelated. And this kind of protectionism, weaponization, et cetera, is something that all companies will have to manage. And I'm going to stop here because as I said, if you don't stop me, I will just keep talking. Uh, thank you, but certainly we would like to listen more uh, from you. Uh, we may uh, later on uh, plan that separately. Sure, but sure. thanks a lot for sharing your insights from uh, your experience, your first-hand experiences doing research and advisory for uh, uh, private firms and uh, countries uh, uh, who are influenced by this or who are affected by this. But uh, let me now, uh, I was also thinking a lot about uh, what this conflict means from various perspectives. And uh, maybe I'll just uh, pose a few questions to Ambassador Patrick, to uh, who can uh, uh, explain more with more authoritative manner uh, some of these issues. Firstly, I would like to uh, take a look at your own country, Ambassador uh, Patrick, uh, because uh, France has been a proponent of strategic autonomy, uh, just like how India also talks about strategic autonomy as one of its key pillars in its uh, foreign and strategic policy. So, uh, uh, you know, that uh, President Macron had uh, previously mentioned NATO as, uh, you know, brain dead, and then you have this conflict happening. And uh, France already had this wish, perhaps, if I'm right, had this vision of Europe also pursuing strategic autonomy. Uh, obviously, with, uh, France has that interest in, in that. But do you think that this conflict has totally uh, undermined France's larger strategic plans for leadership in Europe? That is something which I would like to uh, know from you. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, leadership, uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> because <laughs> we are all equals in Europe. We are, we are of course, there are more uh, bigger countries than others. Well, as you know, we, we, we had for long a close relationship with um, Germany, for example, but not only now you, you see Poland emerging as a real military power. Um, uh, we are close to the southern countries also, uh, Italy, Spain. Um, we regret that the uh, UK left 
the EU. Why? For two reasons. I say that sometimes to my British friends uh, for two reasons. The first one is that uh, EU, as any institution organization, needs to be reformed all the time. Any organization needs to be reformed all the time. And UK wa was very um, sometimes felt at any, any, not at ease uh, in, within Europe and was trying to, to change the rules. And, and, and it was uh, useful because when you, and, and France did the same. So both, uh, both countries together could have had more chance to reform Europe. I remember before the Brexit, a well-known uh, speech. If you did not listen to that speech, I will recommend you to do that one, one day by David Cameron, prime minister in 2013. I think it's uh, in February uh, 2013 on the reform of Europe. A great speech. As a Frenchman, I would have signed, I would have uh, support that uh, the orientation contained in that speech. So you, 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 you talk about leadership. In fact, yes, in fact, you have uh, countries more proactive, but it's changing. And I think it would be a mistake for France to pretend to be a leader in Europe. We, we know that we have a role to play, but we have to respect all, all our partners. Uh, the, the, the six uh, original historical founders of Europe uh, and, and, and the new ones. Concerning um, strategic autonomy, it's, it's, still, it's still an orientation of our politics. But as I tried to explain, it will be more and more difficult out of this war in, in uh, Ukraine because uh, Ukraine, uh, a consequence of the war is that it really vitalized NATO. So what will be what will be uh, uh, Europe within NATO concerning defense? And it's, it's a key question because without any, any uh, strategic autonomy, you, don't, you cannot build a real political entity. Uh, the first step is to, have to, to, um, to organize your defense. Defense, is, it's, it's, it's vital for everybody. No, it's a, it's 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 a requirement for for development. It's a, a requirement for peace in society, of stability and development. So um, we will uh, continue to we will see what what it will be after the war. Uh, but I don't think that we will abandon that orientation. I think it's a necessity. If not, okay. well, if if not, we'll be, we will be back at the, at the time where block where blocks were dominating east west at the time of East-West confrontation, and we don't want that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another uh, thing which I want to know from you is that, uh, you know, in the, when the time the, the conflict broke out, uh, we were of the impression that perhaps this conflict could uh, help heal the divisions in Europe, which started, has, uh, which started coming up in the past few years uh, between, let's say, uh, in a stereotypical way, the West versus East, uh, the old Europe versus New Europe and all those things. But uh, of late, we have seen that uh, that may not be the case. Uh, please correct me if I am wrong. For instance, uh, we have the Hungarian president uh, towing a very different line when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine conflict as to how uh, he and this country views it. So what do you think uh, has this co conflict changed the trajectory of European uh, you know, unification and political stability in Europe? Um, you are right, I think um, uh, Ukraine uh, led us to more, more unity, but it doesn't prevent some members to, to pursue their, their own path, like Hungary. It's not a big problem. We can manage that. I, we can accept that a country has specific relations. You know, even in France, you know, you know in France, uh, public opinion is a little bit split. Because we, we traditionally had good relations with Russia, and there are, there are still uh, people in France who are reluctant to, to, to organize uh, uh, to, 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 to the support we are giving to, to Ukraine. We, we have to, but not, not all agree. So we have our, our difference. We see our countries. We don't have a Hungary within France, but you understand me. 
So uh, it was a surprise to many people that uh, uh, during this crisis, uh, Europe uh, got more united than before. We, we also explained that during the pandemic also, because we, had, uh, because we don't have a common uh, health policy in Europe. We are a common policy for, for agriculture, for example, but we don't have for health, but nevertheless, there was a global uh, European reaction to that pandemic. We organized them ourselves and it worked quite well. So we did the same for Ukraine and that doesn't prevent some countries to have some slightly different view, even Italy. Italy, uh, you uh, um, saw that uh, Mrs. Uh, Georgia Meloni, uh, new prime minister, is relatively pro-Ukrainian. She, she just went to Kiev. But if we, you take the Italian public opinion, it's, it's a different thing because uh, Italy is more pro-Russian, I would say, uh, for, for, for different reasons. Not only because of, of, only of Berlusconi, not only because of that, also for economic reasons, because they are quite dependent also on, on Russia for energy and for many reasons. And it's so a question of sensitivity, sensitivity. It's not always a question of economy. In France, it's the same. It's the same, you know, we have a certain idea of the Russian culture that we admire. And it's difficult now to, to consider Russia as, as opponent to, to our freedom. And, and so it's difficult. We don't, we, we don't like that at all. So I hope that soon uh, this war will be over. We, we are, we are well, it's, it's in our obsession that the war as soon as possible will be over. But how? It doesn't depend only on us. Thank you, Ambassador. It's, it's a it's a mix it's a mix uh, picture it's a mixed picture <laughs> united yeah. and division, but for the moment it's it's going quite well. So we, we are quite, solidarity between members is quite good for the moment. Okay, great to know that. Uh, uh, now I would like to turn to Sada, and we have mentioned about the overall uh, supply chain, how uh, it has there is this whole thing about diversification of supply chains away from China. Uh, that brings me to this picture that, you know, perhaps if you look uh, four or five years back itself, I think that the world should have been preparing for this because we had the trade war, which was, which was started, which uh, kind of uh, was hinting at the same thing that, you know, you should diversify your supply chains. And this is not just from China, for any country who's over dependent on any other country for that matter. Yeah. And then we have COVID also, which also, I think, strengthened the need for countries to not just put all their eggs in one basket. So uh, uh, what is you, your view here? Have you, do you, or have you observed that whether the companies, for instance, were how prepared they were when the, this conflict erupted, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, they should think about diversification of their supply lines, uh, how prepared they were for doing all this, because the signs are already there in the past few years that the overall trend is changing. Yeah. You know, that's, that's actually a very interesting question. And I think something that we all grapple with because data from China is very hard to sort of come by. Um, but, you know, when we talk to executives in the last four or five years, everybody says that, um, yes, we need to diversify out of China. I think two thirds executives would say that. Um, there have been attempts, you know, very public attempts, and iPhone is an example, Samsung is an example. But I think uh, not just the companies, I don't think even the governments were ready uh, for sort of this kind of event, which would um, put the ad adversarial relations in such stark limelight. You know, uh, Europe still, for example, after the Russian conflict happened a couple of months back, uh, uh, Chancellor Sh uh, Sh Olaf Scholz was in, it was in China. Um, a clear testament that the, yeah, Europe cannot take uh, the, the sort of Russia and, uh, Russia and China together. Um, it should have happened. So there was the China plus one strategy, uh, which I think a number of com companies uh, are thinking about. So they're building something in Vietnam, something in Taiwan, something in Bangladesh. But you have to realize, you know, what China built in 30 years, a single country, a single market, the cost of capital, the labor, uh, the kind of government control which made things easier, it's not easy to replicate. Um, iPhone, for example, gave almost 30 years uh, sort of in innovation with China to be able to get them where they are. So I think India comes the closest to the kind of things that China can offer. But it, it's the way the world is moving, none of us will probably have time before, before some sort of major events start happening between the two superpowers. 
it takes a lot of time to diversify supply chains. Um, the kind of things we've built. So that talks about going to Mexico. Yes, some part of automobile can of course go to Mexico. That talks about going to Poland. That talks things of doing things in Japan. But last thirty years, we've we've built a very specialized, uh, as I keep saying, component fractured trading system. Semiconductors, for example, you've put restrictions on China, but the but the key part is that China is the major manufacturer of consumer electronics. which means semiconductors and chips about 30 40% are used in china which essentially means that all your products are going to get more expensive you're in an inflationary mode there is cost of living crisis in so many countries countries will have to balance economics and politics i think okay uh, i would also like to know from you another thing which you mentioned which was about <coughs> energy transition and we all know that again energy transition is something uh, which initially was kind of spurred by this whole climate change related concerns yeah. and this whole, whole quest for renewable energy and this has been the trend for a long period of time until uh, quite recently when this whole crisis erupted we saw countries dropping the big picture and going after their immediate requirements for which they started uh, again depending on uh, hydrocarbons you know especially in europe for that matter so uh, uh, how do you evaluate the impact of this particular crisis on uh, the energy trans overall energy transition trend you know so very interestingly and this is my favorite uh, i think the the horizon scanning we did um, in an article that i wrote in 2021 i called 2023 the revenge of the fossil fuels um and it's not just uh, russia ukraine we've been seeing trends of uh, of this in the last couple of years so in 2021 uh, there was a hydrocarbon failure uh, sorry i'm sorry hydropower failure in china because of massive droughts right so nine provinces in china had to ration electricity these are all industrial power houses at that time president xi jinping uh, very visibly relaxed his um, coal usage restrictions that have been put in place it's the same case with all of the other asian power houses when the covid demand rebounded japan south korea india etc they all stepped up their 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 sort of coal usage um and also i think and i would say with the, with with uh, with many caveats that uh, the sort of energy transition has been devoid of any geopolitical assessments right so while um, american and and uh, european companies now control only about 15% of oil and gas market uh, all the state owned enterprises in countries which are not necessarily democracies end up controlling about 40 to 60% of the oil and gas market uh, the the sort of this leverage in 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 a geopolitical troublemaker that russia has been pretty evident right so the energy transition is is obviously a, a writing on the wall you cannot do away with it it's it's uh, something that that the climate change requires but the transition is going to be fraught with politics so at least in 2023 i think we are going to see a massive scramble for uh, for hydrocarbons for the the dirty fossil fuels as they call it what also sanctions on russia have done is they fractured the certainty of the hydrocarbon market right so now for example oil you have three prices you have the the price that russia is selling at you have the price that's determined by the price cap of the west and then there is a shadow price right uh, along with that there is every country that's scrambling for oil they are outbidding countries like pakistan smaller african countries increasing their import bills uh, so it's going to be a very fractured market the move towards uh, transition to energy is obviously a silver lining but i think ambassador patrick would agree there is a a sort of a, france versus germany on nuclear in green taxonomy that's that's sort of one aspect of politics but also china has made itself very central to any transition to energy right so not only do they con- about 70% of the solar panels uh, wind turbines um, but now increasingly hydrogen electrolyzers are also being made in china they've not done anything about it but rare earth minerals for example 80% processing happens in china how will you sort of navigate all of that and you know building nuclear plants for example britain is trying to build a nuclear plant at hinchley when you have that cost of living crisis and that high inflation and and sort of demands from the public how will you build those nuclear plants it's a very expensive proposition so i mean i think the transition will happen but it's going to be very uneven it's going to be fraught with the back and forth and and, and and the economics of the world will have to balance that certainly yeah, uh, it seems to be quite a revenge as as you have put it that way yeah. uh, now i would like to uh, take uh, questions from the audience uh, we have yes. a question from uh, pallavi herself uh, her question is to ambassador pascal uh, 
Uh, in your view, in its current structure, will the UN and UNSC continue to play any significant role in global politics? If yes, what role do you envision the United Nations to play? If no, what changes are required to keep the UN uh, relevant? Ambassador yeah. Pascal? Yes, I, I, I try uh, during my presentation to, to answer that question already. I will uh, say the same. We, we have to reform the UN. The UN should reflect, in particular, the Security Council should reflect more the uh, state of the world. For example, uh, I had this figure, the G7 uh, represent uh, some years ago, 60% of, of world wealth. Now it's only 40%. That means there is not, not there is a different world, you know, that we have to take into consideration. Uh, as regard to, to the objective of the UN, I don't think we, we have to change because the UN has been built mainly for safeguarding peace and security in the world, also for development and that very noble ideals and objectives that we have to give. But we have to reform the UN. It will, won't be an easy task, but I think that thanks to the consequence of the war, we, we can do that because it will require ma major change. Okay, uh, Prashant Jain has a question, in what ways has the Ukraine conflict challenged or strengthened the concept of regionalism? But I think that has been uh, covered. Uh, on our discussion, but thanks for raising that question, Prashant. And yeah, uh, uh, Professor Vinod has mentioned that VUCA world means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, for the best That's of the right. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, now, the questions from our students. Uh, we have a question from first year uh, MA Geopolitics student Akshay Gopal. Uh, Russia under Putin wanted to act as a big brother to Central Asian republics and bring them under the indirect control. So how does Russia-Ukraine war impact the relationship between Russia and Central Asia? Will there be a deviation from the Russian path by the Central Asian countries and move towards the Chinese or the United States? I think uh, Ambassador Pas Pascal uh, would be able to uh, explain this. I think it's, it's a very important question because uh, it's my conviction, and I was ambassador there, as you know, in yeah. Central Asia. And I think it will be a key region of the world in the near future. And uh, you have Russia, but you have China, you have India already, a uh, big interest, you have Iran, you have a lot of, uh, and, and, and uh, Europe and the United States are relatively uh, staying distant from, from that region. I regret that. But I, I think also that it's an illusion to consider that under Putin, uh, Russia was a big brother because the situation had already, cha already changed before the war. Uh, uh, Russia still had influence uh, in particular through soft power. For example, in a country like Turkmenistan, where I was ambassador, I had the fourth gas reserve in the world. Uh, you had uh, uh, double nationals, you have a uh, Russian culture still present. Russian was a language uh, used in the administration, politics with people, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs has been, has been educated at, at Lomonosov University in Moscow. Uh, President Berdy Mohamedov uh, is a stomatologue, uh, also educated in Russia, etc., etc. But it was, it was in, in France through so, soft power, but it was no more dominating power. Uh, I think the Russians were playing quite uh, skillfully, very well, because they didn't want to, to provoke their, their former partner, member, member of the Soviet Union, former Republic of the Soviet Union. Uh, President or Minister of Foreign Affairs came at once a year to Turkmenistan. I, I met last time uh, uh, Sergei Lavrov. I know him since uh, 1992, you know. It was not even, a, it was only a director in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I, I, I know Lavrov since that time. I had a dinner with Lavrov in 2000, uh, 2016 in Ashrabad. He came for the inauguration of the new, they built a new big embassy in Ashrabad. But you know, it's not, it doesn't really, they are aware of the big, uh, the, uh, the big brother. The system has changed and it will again change. And, 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 but the question is right, there will be some consequence because this trend to some distanciation of the Central Asian countries from Russia will, will, will continue and, and even further. That doesn't mean that the new big brother of uh, Central Asia will be China. I think, to be frank with you, I think that some country in the region are reluctant to that perspective. They don't want to have a new big brother. But it's difficult for them. A country like Turkmenistan has only one major buyer of its gas now, it's China. So it's difficult to, to keep independence. So uh, I would advocate for more presence from other countries in the world. We can play a role uh, and cooperate. And, and, and we will take all in, into consideration the project of new Silk Road. It will have impacts on the regions. So it's a key region, really a key region of the world. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, next a question from Janardhan, who's also uh, from our MA program, second year. 
The question is to uh, Ms. Radha. Can you please explain more about how West Asian countries strengthen their regional aspirations at the outset of this conflict? And for, to that, I'll just add uh, one uh, thing which I was also wondering about is perhaps how the GCC is uh, navigating this conflict. Are they located in a sweet spot here? Um, uh, yes, I think so. I think if, if there's any region that has gained like a, sort of a lot from the conflict, that is the GCC. Um, so three ways I, I can think of, of how they're um, um, sort of, um, sorry, could you repeat the, the, the first question? Um, what, what, uh, what, the what question was is, the yeah, the question is to how the West Asian countries are strengthening their regional aspirations okay, as a, at the outset of this conflict. Okay, so I will just clarify. I think it's it's basically uh, the GCC countries that have, you know, the oil-rich GCC countries that have really gained from the conflict. Um, there are three ways in which they're strengthening their regional aspirations. The first and foremost is obviously the high oil and gas revenues that they've got in the last year, right? So earlier, what used to happen was that they would channelize these into um, paying the salaries, sort of keeping the, the monarchies alive, basically very non-productive um, stuff. This time, they have very professional sovereign wealth funds. So all of that money has been channelized into the, the sovereign wealth funds, which now are investing all around in the region and abroad as well. I mean, you know, see a number of tech companies now have uh, investments by Qatar, by Saudi, by UAE. So they're creating those regional interdependencies. Second is they, uh, they're in a very sweet spot to sort of um, play the superpowers against each other. Right. So um, the, the the sort of um, the, the, the Chinese the President Xi Jinping made the first visit out of the country. I think it, it was second visit out of the country was to uh, to Saudi Arabia and, and sort of the, the Arab countries. I don't think the, the dollar dominance is going anywhere. I don't think Petro, Petro Yuan is a near thing, but the, the countries will keep using that narrative to demand concessions from both sides. Right. So that that is another way. And then the third one essentially is, um, you know, we're living in in. We're in much better, much better states now. Nobody's talking of a hard recession anymore, but it is uneven economic conditions. You're seeing inflation, you're seeing Fed rate hikes, you're seeing cost of living crisis. Not a lot of venture capitalist funds or, or, or uh, sort of Amer American funds, et cetera, have the money to invest. Most of the money in the world right now, like in 2008 financial crisis, is coming from the Gulf monarchies. Right? So that is another way they're leveraging on their regional and global aspirations. So... Um, it's not going to last very long. Uh, we are seeing uh, oil prices are already falling. There are a lot of changes that are happening in the world. But but this last two years, they have really leveraged on these conditions. And uh, I think that that was the question, right? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sobra. Uh, uh, I have a question from Jayant. Uh, well, basically, he is ask, asking uh, about uh, Angela Merkel's um, interview where she claimed that the Minsk ag agreement was constructed to buy time for Ukraine to militarize. And basically he is questioning whether uh, isn't the West the real culprit in this whole conflict. Uh, but perhaps you can give your perspective on, on uh, that particular, uh, let's say, allegation of sorts. You, you, no, you know, um, this Merkel's interview, uh, when I heard about that, I was very surprised and shocked. I tried to get the text. Unfortunately, I could not read all, all the, the interview, I regret that. But according to what I heard, and the, the question is reporting on that, I'm, I'm still shocked. If she say that, it's shocking because it was never, I think, I hope, our attention to buy time to make a, to organize a, a preparation of the world of confrontation. It was not, not, not our, our intention, I hope so. Uh, he, she even referred in the interview, if I if I'm well informed, about uh, Chamberlain and Daladier in, in 1938, that Daladier bought time uh, in front of uh, Hitler. She made such kind of comparison coming from a German politician. It's really surprising. How could she say that? I'm shocked. Uh, and if she says that, I, I don't agree at all. You see? That's what, what, all I can say because, because we, we, we means agreement with something else. It did not maybe probably it did not work. Obviously, we see that uh, a part of the world is uh, unfolding in in Donbas, in this part of eastern part of Ukraine. But we know, we never in France had the intention to buy time to organize the war, to prepare the war. Uh, I, I don't know what she said. Why she said that? I I don't know why. Uh, 
to please uh, <laughs> because of a good relation with uh, their former Russian friends. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand at all. So I'm shocked. Like uh, the student was uh, rightly the question. I'm shocked. I'm okay. still shocked. Uh, uh, staying with the ambassador, another question uh, by uh, one of our students, Aditya Kumar. Uh, what he is asking whether uh, you know, uh, just like the weapon proliferation which happened in Afghanistan, Pakistan region during the uh, Afghan war uh, after the Soviet invasion, what will happen to the weapons that are given by the West to Ukraine uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war? Yeah, uh, he is asking about the proliferation prospects and how it might uh, I mean, destabilize the situation in the region and perhaps even beyond. No, it's a, it's a it's a it's a relevant uh, question. Of course, it's a, uh, worrying. Uh, we had this experience also uh, with, with the war in Yugoslavia, because a lot of weapons now are circulating in Europe, coming from the war in Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia. I hope it won't be the same. Uh, reportedly, the Americans are exerting a tight control on 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 uh, weapon deliveries i hope so I, I, hope, I hope it's well done but we never know what what could happen because there is a now, right right now a big accumulation of of weapon of all kinds uh, well so we we have to follow that uh, carefully yes yeah uh, there are actually a lot more questions coming in but uh, i think because of the paucity of time we won't be able to take it all but I think I'll just uh, finish with one more question to um, Shraddha. Uh, this question is from Mr. Rakhil Ajit, who's a, a student, second year student at our program. Uh, Mr. Shraddha, uh, Mr. Shraddha, how regional trading agreements such as RCEP mitigates or reduces the impact of economic fallouts from the sanctions in the case of the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Um. RCEP is far from being an operational trade agreement, uh, economic cooperation agreement at the moment. You know, it started off really well. A number of countries ratified it, but they've not been able to agree on protocols, import cut duties, how the supply chains are going to pan out. Unfortunately, in Asia, um, every trading agreement has now acquired or economic agreement has acquired a geopolitical dimension. You know, it's, it's either meant to on one side contain China and on the other side, China to assert its dominance. So um, RCEP, I don't think, has any power right now to sort of mitigate from any economic fallout or sanctions. It's, it's not there yet. Um, I, I don't know whether it'll ever reach there given, given how Asia is probably one of the countries where the superpower rivalries are, are manifesting to the hilt. The kind of economic cooperation that existed um, is being very fundamentally ruptured and that has massive geopolitical and military implications. So uh, in one line, I, no, I don't think it can have much impact at the moment. Okay, I think uh, we have uh, a lot more other questions to answer, but I think because of the paucity of time, uh, we, we couldn't uh, deal with, we, we wouldn't be able to deal with that. But thank you, uh, and really thank all the audience for coming up with uh, really good questions. Uh, it certainly has brought out the best out of, from the two speakers that we had. And I thank uh, both the speakers today, Ambassador Patrick, as well as uh, Ms. Radha, for enlightening us on various dimensions, whether it is political, diplomatic, security, or geoeconomic dimensions of this conflict. Uh, we stand uh, more informed uh, after interactions with both of you at the end of this session. And I thank Asian Pathfinders for helping organize and uh, bringing in two very eminent experts on this particular uh, event. So thank you, uh, Ambassador Patrick and Ms. Radha, and thanks. Uh, well, May I thank you also, and Mrs. Uh, uh, Palavi Ade also, who, who did a great job in organizing that exchange, and Ms. Mrs. Shrada, who is a very dynamic uh, <laughs> uh, person, and, and I was very pleased to, to have an exchange uh, be on the same uh, discussion uh, today with, with her, and also the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Patrick. It's such a privilege. Um, and, and whoever has questions, you know, you can find us on LinkedIn and, and send us your questions. We're yeah. happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you, Shaka, the Ambassador. Thank you, everyone. And have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Good weekend.